Welcome industry partners. We appreciate you taking the time to attend the FY24 8A Stars 3 PMR. My name is Herman Lyons and I'm the 8A Stars 3 Program Manager. Today's PMR is an opportunity for the 8A Stars 3 team to share information and discuss important topics with 8A Stars 3 industry partners. I do have a few announcements before we begin. Your attendance and time on call is being captured by Zoom using your contract number and email address. Everyone is on a mute only mode due to the large number of participants and to eliminate potential interruptions. Closed captioning has been enabled and we did not receive any questions in advance of the PMR, but we do have the Q&A pod available. We will address questions if time allows. The webinar is being recorded and, we, and it will be shared with you early next week along with a copy of the presentation. Joining me on today's call is Gene Flubov, the 8A Stars 3 Procuring Contracting Officer, Leslie Kirby, your 8A Stars 3 Program Analyst, and Kia Perrin, who is the Director of the Office of Certification and Eligibility at SBA. Today's agenda will cover the topics shown on this slide. I'll kick things off with a year in review and highlight some of the new resources that we developed in FY23 before handing it over to Gene to discuss master contract performance. Leslie will cover the CPRM reporting and Kia will provide an 8A program update. We'll close out the webinar with a look at FY24 before wrapping things up and addressing questions submitted through the Q&A pod. So the year in review, through FY23, 8A Stars 3, industry partners have generated 805 task orders valued at more than $4 billion. You can see the number of task orders and their total estimated values for FY21, 22, and 23. You may have noticed the decrease in the number of task order awards issued in FY23 compared to FY22, and we attribute this 8% decrease to the ultimate decision and the impact that it has had on 8A procurements government-wide. Although the number of awards decreased, you'll see that the total estimated value increased from $1.6 to $2.3 billion, an increase of about 45%. The total obligated value of all task orders is $1.5 billion, and the average task order value is $5.1 million, and that's the result of many sizable task orders. I find that the median value of just over $3 million provides a more accurate depiction of what we commonly see. Lastly, FY23 has produced the five largest task order awards totaling nearly half a billion dollars with the largest value at $108 million and issued by USDA. Slide five highlights agency use sorted by the number of task orders awarded. Department of Homeland Security, Health and Human Services continue to hold the top two spots with 135 and 97 orders. The Department of Treasury surpassed USDA at the number three spot with 88 orders compared to the 64 by USDA. Wrapping up our fifth spot is Air Force with 46 orders. You'll see that I added the Department of Air Force, excuse me, Army as the number six on this list. I included Army because we often receive the questions on whether Army is permitted to use the 8A Stars 3 GWAC or if they're required to use the Army chess vehicle. We don't know what happens in every Army buying activity, but you can see that the Army is clearly using the 8A Stars 3 GWAC for their IT services needs. It may be a good idea to refer to this point when speaking to Army customers that are reluctant to use 8A Stars 3. I'll allow you to view the estimated value at your leisure, but I want to bring attention to the third column that highlights the number of industry partners receiving task order awards from these agencies. You'll see that these top agencies are doing pretty good at uh, distributing the task order awards among several industry partners, which is a good indication of industry partner experience and also your outreach. Slide number six, we'll discuss delegations of procurement authority, and we will continue to host live DPA training on the second Tuesday of each month, and we'll continue through the remainder of FY24. We also have on-demand DPA training on YouTube for those customers who miss the live training and don't wait to wait for the next go around, or they may simply prefer self-paced training. We issued 360 delegations in FY23, and our top five agency DPA holders are Homeland Security, GSA, Defense, Air Force, and Treasury. 
you'll notice that only two of our top five DPA holding agencies are in the top five users as shown on the previous slide. That was Homeland Security and Treasury. This is a reminder to focus on creating DPA holders and not chasing them. For example, a capture plan focused on DOD based on the number of delegations is probably not the best approach. Although we've issued 109 DPAs, it has resulted in only 38 task order awards. Now, my colleagues may roll their eyes, but I like to tell a story when I talk about delegations. And I'll tell the story of two shoe salesmen from different companies who visit a remote village to sell shoes. Upon arrival at the village and looking around a bit, the first shoe salesman calls his boss and says, we've wasted our time. No one here wears shoes in this village and I'll be heading home shortly. The second shoe salesman visits the same village and calls his boss to say, we've hit the jackpot. No one wears shoes in this village. I often tell this story when I talk about delegations of procurement authority because the perception often points people in the wrong direction. I would encourage you to forget about who has a DPA and focus on the right customers for your business. Then encourage them to obtain their DPA, which can be done quickly and at any time. Slide number seven highlights industry partner performance. There have been 357 industry partners who have received task order awards. 269 single business entities and 88 joint ventures. 187 of the industry partners with task orders have received two or more awards. This number jumps out to me because we're not talking about 10% or 20% of our industry partners with, with more than just one award. We're talking about more than half. I think that most industry partners on the call with two or more task orders would agree that the first one is the hardest to secure. So if you don't yet have your first task order award, keep pushing. We can almost guarantee that the second and third and fourth will be easier than the first. And then lastly, there were 205 rising stars, which we're very proud of. The term rising stars is used for a couple of different reasons. You'll notice that we refer to rising stars in our monthly snapshot to identify industry partners receiving their first 8A Stars 3 task order award. Internally, we've coined this term to identify industry partners who've received their first GSA contract vehicle order through Stars 3. For example, a Stars 3 industry partner with multiple GSA contract vehicles would be coined as a rising star if they received their first GSA contract order through 8A Stars 3. We're very proud of this metric as it shows that 8A Stars 3, even when compared to other GSA acquisition vehicles, continues to provide ample opportunities to small disadvantaged businesses. Now, slide number eight, we'll go ahead and transition to some new resources developed in FY23. The 8A Stars 3 Resource Center is located at bsc.gsa.gov slash S3. This first of its kind GWAC resource was launched in November 2022 through collaboration between the 8A Stars 3 team and also GSA's multiple award schedule team. The site is a repository for dozens of 8A Stars 3 resources to include listen and learn recordings with successful 8A Stars 3 industry partners, contract resources such as the Welcome Kit, marketing material to include brochures and signs, monthly snapshots, and also recordings of industry partner training, such as this PMR. So a month from now, when you can't locate this PMR recording, you just need to visit the 8A Stars 3 Resource Center. This is a great resource that you should consider when share, you should consider sharing with anyone in your team and especially new employees that will be working on the 8A Stars 3 GWAC. Slide 10 shows our updated 8A Stars 3 brochure with the sole source and competitive ordering processes at the top of page two. This brochure update was in response to the many questions that we receive on how to issue task order awards. We have an ordering guide that details the entire task order award process, but we thought that an abbreviated version would give a high level understanding of how the process works. A limited number of free print copies may be ordered by 8A Stars 3 industry partners at cmls.gsa.gov. You may search for this publication using Stars 3 or the publication number shown at the bottom of this slide. Slide number 11 features our newest resource, the 8A Stars 3 infographic. This infographic was created in July of 2023 by a graphic artist intern spending time with GSA this summer. The reason that you probably haven't seen this resource is because it's internal to GSA and we use it for high level briefings. For example, GSA's administrator, Robin Carnahan, used it to brief at an equity principals meeting in July. 
ITC Assistant Commissioner Laura Stanton used it as a reference in her Great Government Through Technology blog and also for a briefing to the Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization Interagency Council. Again, the resource is internal to GSA, but feel free to create your own version if you think that will, it will aid in your success. At this time, I'm going to transition the presentation over to Gene, who will cover master contract performance. Gene? Yeah. Hey, Herman, before I get started, uh, there's a couple of questions from your part of the presentation that I think uh, might be best addressed before we move on. Uh, could you take just a minute and uh, further explain what a what a DPA is and, and how agency CEOs get one? Sure, Gene. Uh, a DPA is a delegation of procurement authority, and a DPA is required for any contracting officer issuing a task order award against the 8A STARS 3 GY. So all of the industry partners with task order awards should have a, a federally warranted contracting officer who obtains a delegation of procurement authority. Uh, DPAs can be obtained in a, a few different ways, as I discussed. It can be uh, the second every second Tuesday of the month, we offer live DPA training. If you'd like to see a list of that training, you can always view the snapshot that we spend it, send every month, or you can go to gsa.gov slash events to see a list of the training. Also, as I mentioned, we've got a on-demand YouTube training that can be taken. Uh, we also have a course at Defense Acquisition University, as well as contracting officers may also review the 8A STARS 3 ordering guide that I reference. Very, very important. Once your customer does one of those review methods, they request their uh, DPA on a GSA website, which is gsa.gov slash GWAC DPA. Now, I realize that that was a lot uh, all of a sudden, but if you have questions about the DPA process, or if your customers have questions about the DPA process, please go ahead and send that email to s3 at gsa.gov and we'll make sure we get your question answered and we can also pull them in to make sure that they completely understand the process. Yeah, and, and one other question uh, that I think is a great thing to address right now is uh, how, how are we doing on STARS 3 uh, with sole source versus uh, competitive awards? That's a good question. Uh, Generally speaking, the 8A STARS program, and when I say the program, I'm referring to STARS, STARS 2, and STARS 3, has been about 90 to 93 percent sole source awards. Uh, we've seen a little bit of a change on the 8A STARS 3 GWAC, where the number of competitive task order awards has increased. So right now we're looking at about 85 percent uh, of the task order awards issued on STARS 3 are sole source awards, um, which means that 15 percent were awarded competitively, well, which we like to see. We like to see the number of competitive awards increasing and our 8A, 8A Stars to Industry partners um, competing for those and actually winning. Okay, Herm, uh, I think that's kind of tapped uh, all the questions that uh, were focused on some of the things you spoke to. I'll, okay. go, ahead and, I'll go ahead and get started and and it's really great to, to hear all the amazing things that our industry partners have accomplished uh, this past year. And I'm, I'm really excited uh, to see what the rest of uh, FY24 comes, uh, brings. Uh, as this slide says, my name is Gene Fluvog and I am the STARS-3 uh, Contracting Officer or CO. And while Herm's uh, comments focused on task order activity, uh, the next portion of the PMR is gonna address performance from the master contract perspective. And uh, while we have seen some improvement in compliance with contract requirements during this contract year, there's still a lot of room for improvement. Uh, and, and I'll speak to those uh, here in a bit. In addition to discussing uh, several ways that uh, we can make improvements, I'll share some uh, rather less than encouraging performance uh, indicators and trends that I've noticed at the master contract level. Go ahead, next slide, please. Uh, if, if you're not aware, uh, and this is really directed to all of our industry partners, we deliberately designed STARS-3 with a very limited number of contract deliverables at the master contract level. And you will find those outlined in section G of your contract. They include designating a STARS-3 program manager, maintaining a STARS-3 webpage, establishing and monitoring uh, a STARS-3 email address, and reporting task order activities such as awards, modifications, 
subcontracting and invoicing. And then of course, uh, remitting the contract access fee after you've been paid for the work on a task work. And then finally, there is one other annual report, which is a supply chain risk management plan. To those of you who have submitted these reports already, uh, I thank you. Uh, for the remainder who have not, please make sure you take a look at sections G19 and G20 of your contract and uh, come into compliance with these reporting requirements. Unfortunately, the, the STARS-3 team has spent a significant amount of time and effort this year following up on invalid email addresses and late contract deliverables. And the worst thing is that these were two big problem areas last year. As an example, the timely subcontract reporting at the end of contract year was only 13%, despite the fact that we ran several uh, reminders in the monthly STARS-3 newsletter. And even after sending out delinquency notices to over 900 program managers, almost 30% of our industry partners still have not submitted this required report. We haven't focused on compliance for the supply chain risk management plan yet, as we've been focused on uh, other actions, but we will start uh, enforcing compliance on that report uh, in the new year. If you have not been awarded a task order yet, you still are responsible for that negative subcontracting report laid out in uh, section G19 of your contract. The second trend that I've noticed involves delivery failures on emails when we send it to your STARS-3 program manager or that required STARS-3 at your mail domain uh, email address. We intentionally, again, minimize contact and communications from our office so that you industry partners can focus on capturing and performing work at the task order level. But if you're not receiving at least one email from s 3 hesagovernor every 30 to 45 days, you've missed an important message from our office. So please ensure that you monitor your star Street email address and that messages from s3 at gsa.gov are not being blocked by your mail server's uh, spam filter. Additionally, that stars three at your mail domain address is the address that's tied to our all awardees distribution list. And while there have not been a, a significant number of fair opportunity notices, we have seen some, and we've even seen a few uh, solicitations issued using that all addressee uh, distribution list. For the industry partners that have received a task work, the monthly reporting requirements at sections G17 and G18 of your contract begin by, at the end of the month following that award. I won't speak to this a lot because Leslie uh, will talk about reporting in the CPRM later during her portion of the, the PMR. But I do want to provide just a brief explanation as to why we ask you to upload contract award documents and statements of work. As Herman said, one of the things we do is we train agency CEOs and then we delegate to them the authority to issue orders against our GWAC to make sure that they are complying with the terms of the contract and to help avoid problems uh, before they develop, we do a 100% review of all awards and all statements of work. So we need your assistance so that we can complete that post award review by awarding, by attaching those supporting documents in the CPRM. The next two trends on my slide here are primarily government problems, but I'm asking you for your help in these areas as well. The STARS-3 team does continue to see a few awards made by agency CEOs who have not been properly trained and delegated to use the STARS-3 GWAC. We're also seeing a, a number of awards where they haven't included the contract access fee as a separate contract line item number. We require this in the contract to avoid a, a problem at the end of the period of performance if you didn't include the CAF as a separate line item number and the, the CPRM is calculating that CAF on top of your labor costs, then you'll run into a situation where our system believes that your 
trying to report uh, obligation in, or uh, allocation of funds in excess of the authorized obligation. So please make sure again that your your contracts, your offers, and your awards include that CAF as a separate line item number. The next couple of slides will provide some recommendations on how to improve performance at the master contract level and how to help our team assist you more efficiently. As I mentioned during that post-award conference and during last year's program management review, we are very much aware of the value that the AA community places on the STARS 3 GWAC. And we understand that many companies see it as a key to entering the federal marketplace. But you have to understand that just like a real key, knowing which locks the key opens is as important as having the key. As Herman mentioned before, over 350 partners have received one or more 8A Star 3 task force. And as he said, the majority of that work was sole source. Now, the other thing that that uh, tells me that while it's great news that over 350 industry partners have gotten work on the contract, that means that over 400 of you are at risk of not being eligible for the option in 2026 because you haven't yet met the minimum contract sales requirement. Also, having a good understanding of the terms and conditions of your contract is essential to your ability to educate those federal agencies that you're doing business with on the benefits of issuing their orders against the, the Star Street contract rather than an open market 8A award. This includes being able to explain the type of work that can and cannot be done on the contract. And that is all covered in section C of your contract. You also wanna be able to talk to the fact of what types of contracts are allowable. STARS does allow fixed price, T&M and labor hour task order awards, but we do not allow cost type contracts. One of the great things about the Star Street contract is that it does allow ancillary support in addition to the principal purpose of labor, uh, IT labor or IT services based solutions. This is important because this gives the agencies a one stop shop for a total IT solution, even when it includes more than just IT labor. Going to talk a little bit about pricing now, and that's addressed in section B of your contract. Your awarded labor rates are fully burdened maximum rates that apply to time and materials or labor hour orders. But you should anticipate that agency CEOs who are preparing to make a fixed price award may look at your awarded labor rates as part of their determination as to whether or not the price you offered is fair and reasonable. All awarded labor rates do include the cost for personal, individual, or facility security clearances up to the secret level. When that work is being performed in the contiguous United States and in non-foreign work areas like Alaska and Hawaii. But agency COs are authorized to adjust the awarded labor rates based on locality differentials that have been established by the Office of Personnel Management. And, this, and also in section B83, we even have authorized agency CEOs to establish different labor rates to meet unique requirements at the order level. Things such as foreign work area requirements or security clearance requirements above the secret level are some of the, the instances where the agency is not bound by your awarded labor rates. Section B12 of your contract also authorizes agency CEOs to select a foreign work area pricing approach when, as, uh, when that work is being done outside of cones. The final part of the contract that I want to touch on is the master contract ordering period and contract year. Regardless of when your Star Street contract was awarded, each contract year runs from July 2nd to the following July 1st. And the base ordering period ends on July 1st of 2026. Agency CEOs are authorized to issue awards with a period of performance 
that extends for up to five years after the end of the, uh, the ordering period, or in other words, July 1st of 2021. If you receive the, the, G, the option in 2026, that ordering period will extend up until July of 2029 and task order performance will be allowed until 2034. Right now, the pricing uh, GSA pricing tool only lists the first five years of pricing, but your awarded labor rates that were provided at the uh, notice to proceed do include your uh, labor rates beyond year five. Now be advised, we will do a economic price adjustment prior to issuing uh, the option. And so there will be an opportunity for some of those prices to increase uh, based on uh, the economic condition of the last several years. When you need uh, help, or if you have questions, contacting the appropriate resource will get the right person working on the issue for you. While the STARS-3 team can assist you with questions related to the contract, the terms and conditions, and so forth, we really can't help you with technical issues related to getting into CPRM or the eBuy platform. Those issues need to be addressed by the appropriate help desk. And questions related to your 8A program status are best answered by your supporting SBA district office. And now just a couple of quick closing thoughts on emails. With over 1,100 industry partners, you can only imagine how many emails we receive on a daily basis. It's a really big help for us if you include your contract number in the section in the subject line or in the body of your email message so that we can quickly determine which contract file to look into. And it also allows us to search our email uh, server for past messages uh, that may be related to your current uh, inquiry. As I mentioned, we do have uh, an all awardees distribution list and that's stars3awardees at gsa.gov. And while some of you have uh, attempted to respond to that email address, we would ask you to never res you know, respond to stars3awardees at gsa.gov or even CC that address when you are responding to a solicitation or a, an RFI that's been published using that distribution list. That's because by doing so, you run the risk of that message being distributed to all 1,100 industry partners. We do deliberately manage releasing uh, messages against that distribution list, so we don't believe that's happened yet, but that's simply uh, another administrative requirement we have to attend to when you CC uh, our awardees distribution list. Herm, that's all I've got. Uh, were there any questions that uh, you thought I needed to address before we move on to Leslie part, Leslie's part of the brief? Yeah, thanks, Gene. Uh, yeah, we had some questions in here. Uh, a few questions about is DHS, DOD, and Air Force, are they allowed to use the contract vehicle? So maybe an overview, Gene, of who has the authority to issue task order awards in terms of agencies. Sure, sure, happy to. Uh, DO, all of those agencies are, are allowed, they are authorized by uh, a GSA administrative order to issue orders against uh, the STARS-3 GWAC. Um, I'd have to, I believe it's in section B of your, uh, your STARS-3 contract. There is a, a section that addresses authorized uh, users of the GWAC and then that points you to that administrative order uh, on the GSA's webpage. But essentially, all federal agencies, uh, to include the Department of Defense agencies, and then there are a number of uh, lesser activities that uh, are also authorized to use that, uh, and they include uh, certain like th agencies like the Peace Corps, uh, certain tribal entities, and so on. Uh, but those are those are all listed in the uh, the admin order. And of course, if you have a specific question, you can always reach out to the team at s3 at gsa.gov, and we can help you work your way through that admin order. Perfect. Thanks for that, Gene. I've got a couple more questions for you, Gene. Uh, one of the questions, one that we commonly get right, is 
Uh, can you please discuss the impact of an industry partner that has graduated or exited from the 8A program as it relates to the 8A STARS 3 GUF? Sure, happy to, Herm. Uh, the, the FAR does allow uh, 8A companies that are on a long-term multiple award contract like this to continue to receive orders even after they exit the 8A program or become other than small. Now, what they do lose when they exit the 8A program is the authority to receive sole source orders on the GWAC. So once a company has exited the 8A program or if they become other than small, then they're limited to only that, uh, that small percentage of competitive opportunities that are authorized, that are uh, competed against the STARS 3 GWAC. Thanks, Gene. Uh, we had a question here about the percentage of industry partners that have received task order awards. Uh, since I talked about that earlier, I'll just let you know that that's, that's about 30, 33% roughly where we are right now. And then, uh, Gene, I'm going to give you one last question. This was a good question, I thought. Um, but they asked, what exactly do you mean when you say ancillary support? Sure, sure. That's, that's a, another, that's a great question. And uh, although the definition is in uh, Part C of the contract, I can talk to it for a minute. So one of, the, one of the underlying requirements for STARS-3, because it is a GWAC, is that the principal purpose of any order issued against the contract has to be for an IT service or an IT services-based solution. And I know, Herm, you've got a great story that you always give during DPA training that uh, say an agency has a requirement uh, for the uh, to relocate a server room from one building to another. Well, that's... That sounds like an IT service, but what if they, they need to do some, you know, some digging or some trenching, or they need to do some minor construction to, to set that new uh, server room up? Uh, that's okay. They can incorporate that as ancillary support uh, under the overarching IT services-based solution. Uh, it can include things like laptops or software uh, and even non-IT labor. For example, uh, if you're running, you know, you're going to, you have a re an agency's got a requirement to operate uh, a help desk. And maybe, maybe there's a need for a, a, you know, a couple of clerical people in there. As long as that principal purpose remains an IT service, some additional ancillary labor or hardware or software uh, is allowable. Now, one of the things that we are seeing uh, more and more of is this thing called software as a service or platform as a service. Well, you would think that because it says service in the name, that by default, it's an IT service. What I would ask you to do is consider what is really being bought. If all you're doing is providing uh, somebody else's software licenses, through a software as a service contract, is that really an IT service or is that a software buy? I would say the answer is that it's a software buy and not appropriate for STARS 3. However, there is a GSA schedule specifically designed for software as a service and platform as a service. Thanks, Gene. And Gene, I know I said that was the last one, but I got, a, <laughs> uh, I got one more that's perfect for you. Uh, an industry partner is, that, is asking, how would I know if I'm not in, in compliance with reporting requirements? Okay. Uh, probably the easiest way to figure out is to look at uh, Section F4 of your contract. There is a summary of contract deliverables there, and that summary will point you at the specific contract uh, section for each deliverable. And like I said earlier, the, the deliverables are, are pretty minimal. There's a once a year subcontracting report and you either do that in CPRM if you have task orders or you simply send an email to s 3 gsagovernor that says you don't have any subcontracting. The second big deliverable is an, a supply chain risk management plan. And that's spelled out in section G20. And you find a great example of what that plan can look like in this pub 800-161. As I said, we're going to start uh, following up on submissions of that supply chain risk management plan in the new year. 
uh, as we've been focused on some other things. So if you uh, if you haven't submitted a supply chain risk management plan uh, in the current ca uh, contract year, you can go ahead and get ahead of that and submit that now, and then we won't have to, to follow up with you for being late. Uh, the final real group of uh, contract deliverables are all directly related to uh, task order activity. That include, and they obviously only apply once you've received a task order award. And those, uh, all of those deliverables are executed through the CPRM where you report the award, attach the supporting documentation, and then uh, report invoicing of your customer agency and you remit uh, the contract access fee to the GSA. Thanks, Gene. That's all I got for you. Thanks, man. Okay. Well, now we'll go ahead and transition on over to Leslie. Um, Leslie, I see you on. You're on, on mute and um, all yours, my friend. All right. Good afternoon. It's great uh, meeting with all of you. Um, this, my name is Leslie Kirby and I am a program analyst uh, working on the GWAC contract families um, and uh, have a small group of other program analysts helping me out with that. Um, wanted to go over the deliverables, um, some of which Jean uh, mentioned. These are the CPRM specific requirements. Um, they will be in section F4 of your contract. And G17 is the order award and modification data. Those, uh, that data needs to be reported within 30 calendar days after the month the document was signed by the order and contracting officer. Your invoice data is due within 30 calendar days after the month, the month that the invoice was paid. Your zero invoice data is due by the end of each calendar month if no invoices were paid. Missing or inaccurate data. Uh, the, the reporting inquiries box will send you a notification if there are some discrepancies in your invoice data or other data and uh, you have 10 days after that notification. Uh, G17.4, the task order closeout verification and validation is, is uh, due within six months after the task order period of performance ends. And CAF remittance is to be paid within 30 calendar days after the month in which the invoice is paid. Next slide. Uh, clarification on CPRM reporting. Uh, your auto feed is on from FPDS to CPRM. However, there are sometimes some glitches uh, in which you will be required to manually enter those, uh, those modifications and orders into the CPRM. Um, even though the feed is on, attachments are still required and you will be required to go in and, and update those. Make sure you look at the CPRM to make sure that um, there are no corrections needed, that all the information in there is correct. The contract access fee on invoices. Um, each paid invoice entry in the CPRM requires a CAF clean, as Jean was mentioning. CAF should be paid on each invoice, and the CPRM automatically adds the CLIN per invoice entry. On monthly invoices or zero invoices, they should be reported 30 days after the month it was paid. And if no invoice for that month, you do need to report a zero invoice. And if later you receive an invoice for a, uh, an order and you, you need to delete a zero invoice report, you can contact the reporting inquiries at gsa.gov to delete that invoice. And just some reminders, uh, make sure your order is reported in the CPRM. If you don't see it, add it. It might be that the order is not in FPDS yet. And DOD orders can take up to 90 days to show up in FPDS. Make sure you upload all supporting documents such as modifications into the CPRM. These uploaded documents aid in researching um, when we're looking for data that has been provided within the CPRM. Make sure you add your zero invoice reports if you have an invoice that has not been paid for a month. And reminder that the CPRM calculates an estimated CAF amount on each invoice entered. This is the amount of CAF that should be on your invoice. The estimated CAF amount should equal the invoice amount.
Any additional information? Um, there's training available on the CPRM homepage. Uh, reports that you can run for task order awards, task orders by company, expired orders. There's comparison on data regarding CPRM and FPDS. And there's an access links to training modules that you can use. Make sure uh, that your bank account recognizes the pay.gov account, which is GSA GWAC ID 47000016B1. For CPRM technical support, as was mentioned earlier, you need to reach out to the Assist Help Desk for any technical issues. You can call them at 877-472-4877 or email them at the uh, email address posted there. If you have any other questions concerning CPRM um, for our GWAC team, you can send an email to the reporting inquiries at gsa.gov email address, or you can submit an inquiry via our CPR inquiry form. And that is all I have. I will pass it back to Jean. Okay, thanks a lot, Leslie. Uh... I was busy uh, answering other questions, so I, I'm not sure that, uh, I don't know that there was any in here. Um, maybe maybe here's, here's a good one. Uh, is a zero invoice report required when the government has not paid an invoice or for when the vendor has not submitted an invoice to the government? And that would be yes. An invoice is required each month if you have an order. Um, zero invoice if you have not received one from the government. But that that re all the reporting in CPRM only becomes necessary once you have an active task. Correct. Correct. Otherwise, yes. the the two other reports, otherwise you do not need one. Yes. The two other deliverables that uh, negative subcontracting report and the scrim plan. Those are delivered, uh, those are submitted to, to the S3 program office through that S3 at gsa.gov email address. All right, so I guess the, the next person up on, on our agenda here is Kia Perrin. Uh, now, Kia has been uh, an active participant in the STARS 3 uh, contract since uh, well before its award, as she was involved in uh, reviewing all of the uh, potential awardees for eligibility. Uh, since that time, Kia has been promoted, and she is now currently the director of the Office of Certificate and Eligi of Certification and Eligibility. And she's had a, she's played an active role in working through the uh, the disadvantaged uh, the social disadvantage narrative that all of you have uh, many of you have had to deal with uh, as a result of the ultimate case. So Kia, you want to give us uh, the latest on how things are going uh, there at the SBA headquarters? Hello, Mr. Hubbard. Thank you, Jane. Hello, everyone. Happy to be on here with you all again. Uh, we know that it's been, um, it's been a challenging time for our program. Um, we, we know that the administration of the OA Business Development Program has been impacted by the- um, hey, hey, Kia, I, I hate to interrupt you, but you're, you're kind of garbled. Can you get maybe a little closer to your mic? Right here. Can you hear me? Is that better? That's much better. Thank you. Okay. Let's try this again. <laughs> um, thank you, um, Jane. I'm happy to be here with you all um, again. And I was just saying that we know that it's been a very challenging time um, with our ADA program. We know that the administration of the ADA Business Development Program has been impacted um, by the, the ultimate support injunction in the order. Right. However, our program remains open for business. Um, SBA, in conjunction with the Department of Justice, has provided ADA program participants and our federal agencies and our partners with very detailed and some guidance on how ADA contracts can continue to be issued, which can continue to be awarded. Um, over the past few weeks, we know that SBA has we work quickly to try to provide guidance to our participants on how to submit your social disadvantage information. And we work very closely um, with our federal agency partners on continuing, um, on their continued use of our program and what that looks like. Um, 
in the week since that injunction, um, FDA has reviewed or, or recertified thousands <laughs> of current AA participants through a process that is inconsistent with the court order. Um, we know for specifically for the AA star 3 BWAC that there were 919 active AA participants. And over 80% of you all have established your social disadvantage narrative. So thank you. Um, we know that that wasn't, it wasn't easy. It wasn't an easy feat. It, 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 was, it, it was a difficult process for many. And so we recognize that and we thank you for helping to meet that requirement. Um, as, we, as we await the final ruling, we just know that FDA, we remain committed to supporting the AA program and ensuring right, equity and procurement. We're, we're going to continue to work to level the playing field and increase access to government contracting um, for small businesses. And we understand that the AA program is crucial, right, in attracting and developing um, a very diverse supplier base. So, just in closing, just now, SBA, along with the Biden um, Harris administration, we remain committed not only to the continued success um, of our 8 program, right, but also just the overall goal of achieving the 15% of um, federal prime contractors awarded to small disadvantaged businesses by fiscal year 25. So we are here. Um, I will remain uh, for the remainder of the training and I'll try to answer questions as I can in the chat. And I'm just looking forward to your continued success. So I will go back to Herman. Perfect. Akia, thanks a lot. And I just wanted to uh, reiterate to our industry partners, Akia mentioned that 82% of, of our active 8A participants on 8A STARS 3 have, have established that social disadvantage narrative. And, and we want to say thank you. Um, just to make sure that every, everyone knows what we're talking about, only those industry partners who are active in the 8A program and also have established their social disadvantage narrative are eligible for sole source awards. Okay. So those 18% of you, who have not established your social social disadvantage narrative, please do so at your at your earliest convenience. If you have questions, I know SBA has plenty of resources, et cetera. But the important thing there is that um, in order to be eligible for any sole source award, you have to get this done. So this is a necessary first. So um, thank you for that, Kia. We really appreciate it. I know that SBA does a great job of updating that social disadvantage narrative list every day because about 8.30 every morning, I'm on there to see. And what Gene and I are taking a look at is which of our AD Star Street industry partners have done it. So thanks again, P.O. Kia. We appreciate it. We we recognize that the AA program is going through many, many changes. And you've been very careful in what you've said today uh, be, so that you don't say anything out of line and we don't get in front of anybody. But again, thanks for all the support that you've provided. At, I know Gene through the pre-solicitation through now. So we appreciate it. Uh, thanks for having me. Mm -hmm, you're welcome. Uh, we'll transition now on, on to the horizon. And, and slide number 22, what, uh, what we've got here is just some activities that we have planned in FY24. Uh, we plan to begin voluntary one-on-one -on -one meetings in January with those industry partners who have not yet met the $100,000 uh, minimum contract sales requirement that Gene mentioned earlier. Uh, we're about halfway through the base period of the contract, believe it or not. And we want to do everything that we can to help our industry partners meet the minimum sales requirements. So what we're going to do come closer to the beginning of the next calendar year is we'll send out a scheduling tool to those industry partners that don't have task order awards. And if you'd like to sit down with the team for 30 or 40 minutes and talk about what you've done and uh, maybe some ideas that we have, we welcome that. We are also planning on hosting our next virtual industry partner training on January 25th. Uh, the Ask the Osdaboo training will feature Calvin Mitchell, who is the Osdaboo for the Department of Education. And actually Calvin is a long time, was a long time GSA national account manager. So he gets GSA and he gets what industry partners missions are. Uh, we'll, in a nutshell, we'll be asking Calvin to, to pull back the curtain on agency Osdaboo's and provide tips on effectively effective engagement with Osdaboo offices. I know I hear a lot of times that it seems like the Osdaboo's are like a black hole, right? And not, Oz, not all Osdaboo's are created equal. We'll get Calvin on and we'll, uh, request that you submit questions in advance and we'll get Calvin's perspective. I know that I've seen Calvin speak and I'm sure that you'll enjoy as well. We'll also be updating our GWAC sales dashboard so that our customers can see the types of work being procured by industry partners. A big driver for this enhancement is the request from customers asking if we can direct them to 
a particular industry partner. And obviously we can't do that and we don't do that, but we think that having this enhancement will point, in, point our customers in the right direction. Additionally, it also gives the STARS 3 team better insight into the work being performed at the task order level. Several members of the 8A STARS 3 team are also planning to attend the National 8A Association Small Business Conference in Atlanta, which is gonna be in February. Several members of the team attended this same conference earlier this year in New Orleans, and we actually had the opportunity to meet with several of our industry partners. Um, we welcome the opportunity to do the same with any of you who will also plan to be at that conference. Again, your, your attendance at the conference is not mandatory, but if you happen to be there, please look out for an email from us and we'll go ahead and set something up to see if we can uh, set aside 20 or 30 minutes to go ahead and meet and talk about 80 Stars 3. And lastly, we'll continue holding DPA training every second Tuesday of the month. Uh, at this time, I'd like to turn it back to Gene for closing remarks and our transition uh, to the questions that we haven't answered. But first, uh, before we do that, Gene, let me go ahead and thank Belinda DeVore for her support in making this PMR success. Uh, many of you know Belinda, and Belinda pushes a lot of buttons and pulls a lot of levers on the back end to make sure that we're good to go for this event. So thank you very much for that, Belinda. And lastly, um, I wanna go ahead and wish everybody who served our country a happy Veterans Day. I know we've got a few members on the 8A Stars 3 team who have served. So uh, from all of us on the 8A Stars 3 team to you, happy Veterans Day. Gene, back with you to close the remarks and uh, we can transition on to questions too, whenever you think the time is appropriate. Sure, uh, I, I don't really have uh, any formal closing remarks, but we've got uh, over a hundred questions in the queue that we haven't gotten to yet. And uh, so I'd like to, you know, everyone is certainly welcome. I know we're approaching the, uh, the hour that we allocated for the, the PMR, but I think uh, some of these questions are, are real valuable. Uh, and we'll start with you, Herm. Can, can, you, can you touch again the, the date for that OSDEBU training? Yeah, so uh, the OSDEBU conference in Atlanta? No, oh, the, I'm sorry, the, Gina, the, yeah, with Calvin. <laughs> yep, our, January 25th. January 25th is the placeholder. Uh, so that's the day for that. And we'll go ahead and send out early in January, folks. We'll send out a save the date. And we'll also include that in our monthly snapshot so you can, you can put it on your calendars. Okay. And uh, I'll, I'll take the next question. There was a comment here about the $100,000 minimum contract uh, sales. That, that is not per year, that is, is simply $100,000 worth of uh, business with across the five years of the contract's base ordering period. Uh, there's a question here, Kia, uh, about the, the two-year rule for JVs on STARS 3. Is that uh, one you want to address or would you like me to take, uh, take a shot at it? So what was the question? I'm sorry, I was busy responding to some of the things in the Q&A. <laughs> yeah, the, all, it, all the question says is, does the two-year rule apply to JV STARS three awardees? And uh, I, I, let, me, let me take a shot. I think what the question is, is does that two-year rule uh, for JVs to get new contract awards limit their ability to get uh, task order awards on STARS 3. And the question, the, the, the answer, and you can correct me if I mess up here, Kia, the answer is not really. The, the two-year rule for JVs deals with new contract awards. Mm -hmm. The JV, however, because it now holds a, a STARS GWAC, they're eligible for competitive awards for as long as they remain on the GWAC, and they will, the JV will remain eligible for sole source awards for as long as the managing AA member is an active participant in the 8A program. Did I get that right, Kia? Exactly right, yeah. Okay. Uh, and I've got one here I'd like to go ahead and address. Sure. I've got a question about, do all sole source uh, awards have to be approved by the SBA in advance? And the short answer is, is yes, all sole source, source task order awards need to go through the SBA offer and acceptance process, which is different uh, than the 8A STARS 2 GWAC. So the short answer is yes. Okay, and uh, a couple couple related ones, Kia, and, and maybe you could uh, get a little closer to your mic uh, this as you answer these. Uh, dealing with uh, the, the, dis the social disadvantage narrative, 
-hmm. the, the first part of the question is, does, does this requirement apply to entity owned uh, or you know, tribal uh, companies? And also, uh, can you clarify what the narrative is? Is it, and why, why don't you just talk to that? The, it looks like there's a question as to whether that disadvantaged narrative is something that's done as part of a, an offer or whether is that something that they deal with uh, the the SBA on? Well, so first, that was basically on firms are not required. Um, do not have the social narrative requirement. And if I end up in the second part of the question, it's well, you know, I'm not quite sure. They're they're asking when is the social narrative required, or at what stage? I'm not quite sure. If your firm came into the program um, using a presumed, um, under a presumption of social disadvantage, then they will now be required to show that social disadvantage, social disadvantage through the narrative process. And so, um, you know, you can work with your DLS. We have all kinds of, I guess, things available online on certified.sba.gov and our knowledge base that will really help you through that process. Um, but I'm not sure that answers the question being. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to scroll through these 100 questions here and figure out what, which ones we, can, we want to address. Hey Herm, can you can you uh, repeat the the National A conference date again, please? Yeah, Gene, I, I don't have it in front of me, but it's in February. Typically, it's uh, late the first week in February or early that second week of February. But again, it's the National A um, Association Small Business Conference. So again, if you just want to Google it, National A Associations Small Business Conference, and if you see it around the the first or second week in February in Atlanta, you know that that's the right event. I also like to address, I think, a few questions kind of, I've turned in my social disadvantage narrative, I haven't heard back, who do I follow up with? I would just ask that you follow up with your service in BOS, a business opportunity specialist. They can reach out um, directly to me and I will find out um, which analyst or my staff is working um, that, that narrative. So just follow up with your BOS if you have any questions about your social disadvantage narrative. If you haven't heard back, if you need some um, assistance in understanding the requirement, feel free to reach out. Okay, and I've got a I've got a great question here. It it says, uh, do we have any thoughts on how states can use the GSA 8A Stars vehicle to? Um, and I'm I'm assuming what this is is asking is is whether or not state level governments are authorized to to issue orders against the GSA uh, schedule or GSA vehicle and the answer is no uh, federal agencies uh, department of defense but as a general rule states are not eligible to use the GSA contract vehicles uh, Hey, Herm, we've got a question here that uh, they're saying we've responded to a lot of RFPs, but we're not winning anything. Uh, have any recommendations? Uh, yes. Um, and actually, that was another question I was looking at, Gene, that says, how do you get sole source awards? And so uh, just to cut to the chase, the name of the game on, on any of these 8A stars program vehicles is, is sole source orders. Uh, when you sit back and you look at the number of industry partners that we have on this vehicle, we've got 1,100 industry partners. And I don't know about you, uh, but for me, if I had an old 8A hat on, I'm not in the business of competing with that many industry partners. So my plan of, my suggested plan of approach would be sole source orders. Those sole source orders, you're typically not gonna see on GSAZ buy, you're not gonna see any RFPs for them, et cetera. Now you may see some RFIs or source of SOC customers and acquisition phase, but I would encourage you to, uh, to focus on sole source orders. Uh, that kind of ties in with another question that we got here and it talks about, you know, as I mentioned, how you get sole source orders. And one thing that I would recommend is to really check out that uh, the 8A Stars 3 Resource Center that I mentioned. There's three videos in there and we call them Listen and Learns. And they're interviews between me 
and our successful industry partners, and they really, really uh, peel back the onion on how to achieve success. Now, nobody's spilling their secret sauce, but they are telling you how they approach the 8A Stars 3 GWAC and how they approach Soul Source Awards. So hopefully that helps, Gene. And then I'll go ahead and uh, mention something else while I'm talking. I saw a question, it was many, many questions ago, and it talked about data, and it talked about the GWAC dashboards and how they, it takes so long for data to get there. Actually, the GWAC dashboards updates every morning. About four o'clock every morning, the GWAC dashboards updates, and it updates with information that's in CPRM. So if you think you're experiencing a lag with, within our GWAC dashboards, please, please let me, let members of the STARS-3 team know, and we can see what's going on. Okay. Uh, I'm going to take one here that says, "Does is the $100,000 minimum contract sales retroactive once met during the base period? Uh, I'm not sure what we mean by retroactive, but that if you meet the $100,000 minimum contract sales requirement uh, at any point during the base ordering period, uh, that one thing that would keep you from getting uh, the, the option goes away. Now, there are a variety of other things that could impact your eligibility for an option. Uh, and those are laid out in section H of your contract. And they include uh, becoming other than small, exiting the 8A program, uh, and, and also being uh, delinquent on any contract access fees that are owed to the GSA for task order performance. But I would, would ask you to, to take a look at section H. I want to say it's H.12 uh, to be sure and uh, look at those things that will prevent a company from getting their option and uh, do whatever you can to, to mitigate those risks. Uh, Kia, we've got a question here and I'm not sure I'm, I'm able to answer it. Uh, it says, are the SBA Apex accelerators able to help small businesses navigate the STARS-3 contract training and reporting? And this may be a question that, that you wanna give the SBA's perspective, Kia, and then uh, Herman, if you want to ch chime in from the GSA perspective as well. So we saw the Apex Accelerator is able to do what, Jim? Uh, help small businesses uh, understand the STARS-3 uh, contract and requirements. I'll take that one, Kia. Yes, so the new Apex Accelerator is what used to formerly be known as, as PTAX or Procurement Technical Assistance Center centers um, do a really, really good job of helping uh, industry understand this acquisition landscape. Um, specifically with 8A STARS-3, the likelihood of you going into an Apex Accelerator and them knowing um, the ins and outs of the 8A STARS-3 GWAC are probably not very high. However, they could probably assist you with overall marketing and their understanding of the 8A program. If you do have additional questions, or I should say when you have additional questions, please go ahead and let us know, reach out, sign up for one of the one-on-ones. You know, Gene, myself, and the rest of the team, we've seen a lot of things over the past, you know, 15 years that we've been working in the STARS program, and we can tell you what has and hasn't worked. So, yeah, go ahead and reach out to Apex Accelerator. I would go ahead and go into that conversation, uh, hoping to get information on how to best market your vehicle. And when you need specifics, please go ahead and reach out to us. Gene, we have another question here about the snippet, the internal resource that we use that I was talking about the administrator using and also Laura Stanton and want to know if you guys could take a snippet of it. And, and the answer is, is yes, uh, please go ahead and create a snippet of it. We would encourage you maybe to, to take GSA's logo off of it if you make some changes. But again, uh, it's yours to use if you'd like. Please, we would ask in accordance with your contract, go ahead and send us a copy in the S3 box. That way we can make sure that everything looks good and give you a, a sign off on it and you can feel free to leverage it. Thanks for that question. Uh, here's, here's a great question for you, Kia. Uh, I, I, I mentioned earlier that uh, exiting the 8A program is one of the factors that will keep uh, a current star three vendor from receiving the option. Uh, and the question is, uh, why, why is that a, a factor uh, for the option when uh, the FAR does allow them to continue to receive orders? Well, 
you're exercising the option, they have to request that they are currently eligible away from. So if you have actually the program was drawn and terminated or otherwise not an eligible aid firm, you will not be eligible for the option. I got one, Jean. How does the new GSA mass 8 a rule um, compare to STARS 3? And uh, <laughs> we, could, we could probably spend two hours talking about this, but um, what I'll say from a high level is that 8A STARS 3 is a GWAC. It's an official government-wide acquisition contract as, um, as categorized and as given the approval by the Office of Management and Budget. Um, GWACs, mass, different ordering procedures, uh, different scopes. Um, we have a master conforming contract. They, they don't. And so there's really a lot going on there. But the one thing that I'll say at a high level is that the scope of a GWAC and the flexibility of a GWAC uh, is, is much different than mass. And that's one of the reasons why GWACs came around in the late 1990s, right, to provide flexibility and to allow uh, customers to achieve um, total IT service-based solutions. So, uh, so I would say the scope, uh, among other things. Hey, Gene, if someone has an updated email address, how would they let the STARS 3 team know that? Oh, that one's, that one's an easy one, Herm. Okay. Uh, just, just, just send it to, to s3 at gsa.gov. And, and I'm assuming that's a change in the, if you change program managers, uh, certainly provide the, the, new, uh, the new program managers full contact information, name, email address, and phone number. Uh, and we will update that in the, our industry partner list that we publish up on the STARS-3 webpage. Uh, got a question here. Can legislative branches and agencies do 8A sole source awards? Uh, and I can, I, we do have situations. Uh, we've seen uh, the, the White House has, has issued a couple of, uh, of task orders against STARS-3. So provided they, they are an executive agent that's listed in the, you know, the, I believe Congress as a, as a entire entity is listed in the uh, admin pub as, a, as an eligible user. So they would follow the same uh, offer and acceptance process that uh, you know, is spelled out. Uh, I know sometimes we did, we did have a challenge with one of the White House uh, task orders uh, being issued by a very small office in in that executive office, and they they really didn't have a warranted contracting officer, but the the GSA worked with them to identify uh, a person to do that, and so uh, if if an agency is an authorized user of GSA, then generally they're eligible to issue uh, either competitive or sole source uh, orders against the GWAC. Uh, obviously, has been mentioned a couple of times. Uh, any sole source order does have to go through the offer and acceptance process and uh, receive a, an approval from the SBA. Gene, we have a question here. Uh, is there any way we can check if a contracting officer is a DPA holder? And the answer is yes. The first thing I would suggest though is engage directly with that contracting officer and ask them have they obtained their delegation of procurement authority. Um, if you got a question about a specific CO, feel free to send an email. You can send an email directly to me, my personal email box and ask me, do they have a delegation of procurement authority? And, and I'll let you know. Now, please don't, don't ask me four or five or 15 different contracting officers, but I'll let you know if a specific uh, CO has obtained their delegation of procurement authority. And what we can do as we can work together and send them an email to make sure that they know about upcoming training. We've got a question here uh, asking about how, how to validate that your email address is accurate. Uh, that, that certainly, you know, I mean, we, we send, like I said, uh, about once a month, we send a newsletter out. Now that does go out to your stars three at your mail domain uh, group email address. Uh, ironically, uh, the office that publishes that newsletter 
has also informed us that about 300 industry partners have unsubscribed from that newsletter. So if you're not receiving the, the STARS 3 monthly newsletter, um, email STARS3 at gsa.gov and we'll make sure that your, your email address, uh, if it has uh, somehow been unsubscribed, uh, is put back on the list for that monthly newsletter and also, uh, you know, monitoring and maintaining that STARS 3 uh, group email address is a contractual requirement and that's, uh, you know, something that you all need to, to make sure you're doing. Okay. We've got a question. If a firm is actively bidding, will they still be penalized for not winning? And I, I'm going to make an assumption here. I know I shouldn't, but I think that maybe you're talking about uh, if you don't meet the minimum contract sales requirement at the option period, will you be penalized? And so I'm going to make the assumption. I don't know if it's a good one or a bad one, but essentially nobody is being penalized for not meeting the minimum contract sales requirement. As Gene said, it's a requirement of the contract to have you an option exercise. So you're not being penalized. Um, you would just not have met the requirement. Okay. And the question right below it, and we may have answered this one, uh, Gene and Kim, we may not, but if a company's exited the 8A program, are they still eligible for the 2026 option, so the three-year option period, provided they have at least one task order award. Well, being an active 8A program participant is one of about six or seven requirements that's in the contract in order to have your option exercise. So the quick answer to that is that if a company had exited the 8A program or is no longer an active participant in the 8A program, they would not have their 8A stars three option exercised. Gene, I know we're, we're at about uh, 75 minutes in from where we started. What do you think, buddy? You got a few more you want to answer or should we go ahead and wrap it up and uh, download these Q&As and see if we can provide some type of response um, when we do the follow-up? I, I think we've, we've start, we're starting to lose folks. Uh, it, that, that may be the best option. We'll, uh, we'll address these, you know, the questions we haven't had a chance to because I, I know a number of them uh, are are duplicative. Uh, that includes, uh, you know, right on the screen right now is uh, contact information for uh, Herman and myself, uh, and also the other contract specialists and uh, administrative CEOs that work on the STARS 3 team. Uh, I, we would ask you, though, that, that for primarily use that S3 at gsa.gov email address. The whole team has access to that. And that also uh, allows us, particularly you know, when one person is out of the office, uh, that allows another member of the team to pick up the, the question and, and respond as opposed to having to wait until uh, someone comes back into the office. Uh, the DPA training does take about an hour and uh, any, any federal agency or any federal uh, person involved in the con acquisition process is eligible to take that training and they can find information on the, uh, the GWAC webpage. Well, I, I apologize uh, to folks who, whose questions we didn't get to. Uh, it's, uh, you know, with, with over uh, a thousand of you on the, on the line here today, we we regret having to limit uh, to typed Q and A, but uh, we were concerned about uh, you know being able to get through this in in a reasonable amount of time. We will uh, go ahead and uh, capture the questions that haven't been answered and publish those uh, along with the uh, the recording of the slide uh, of this webinar and also uh, the base slide deck as well. Anything else you, you need want to add, Herm? No, I think we've, we've, we've done it, Gene. Uh, the next time we do this, hopefully we'll get more questions in, in, in advance of the uh, PMR so we can go ahead and knock them out. But that's all that uh, I have, Gene. Again, just want to thank everyone for attending uh, today's PMR. As Gene said, we'll get these things out. Please expect them probably Monday or Tuesday of next week before we can get the recording together and wrapped up, et cetera. And this concludes the 8A Stars 3 PMR. Thank you for